Hello and welcome to the Think Big series brought to you by PSG. I'm Alicia Sekum and over the next half hour, we're going to be talking balancing the books. This in the context of South Africa's stagnant economic growth, growing unemployment rates and so lower revenue, but increased government expenditure and mounting debt. Yep, Minister Godongwana and his team at National Treasury have had the hard task of keeping many balls up in the air and striking a balance between the need to support the local economy while keeping government finances sustainable. A lot of the detail has already been unpacked over the past week post-budget. So today, we look more so to the future economic landscape and the role of transparency and accountability amidst it all. Joining me to do just that is Director General at the National Treasury, Duncan Peterson. Thanks so much, DG, for joining us today. And I'm going to get straight into it, right? Because we knew it was going to be a difficult budget with revenue coming in 56 billion rand lower than estimates this time last year. Uh, the budget deficit now at 4.9% of GDP and coming with a warning to brace for three more years of that. We have borrowings of 5.2 trillion rand. That's above 70% of GDP and seen peaking at 77.7% in a couple years time. How worried are you about the state of the fiscus? Uh, good morning, Alicia, and thanks for, for having me today. Well, I think we've tried to put forward a budget that strikes the right balance uh, between the various challenges that you've mentioned um, so that we don't have to worry uh, as much uh, about the future. And I think the key elements you've touched on are the ones that we've tried to strike a balance uh, with. Uh, the one being um, how do we ensure debt sustainability given the challenges that we have with our debt situation? How do we preserve critical social spending while making sure that fiscal sustainability is not compromised? And what can we do to ensure that over the medium to long run, uh, our growth prospects improve so that we are able uh, to resolve uh, our social and other challenges? What can we do? It's certainly got in Treasury thinking a bit more creatively. That's the word that's being used in tackling our debt position for one in a slow to no growth economy, DG. Is tapping into Jafekra an easy way out of a difficult situation? Tapping into Jafekra certainly helps, um, but it is by no means a uh, long term solution to our underlying structural problems. I think the reason we uh, did what we did on Jafekra was mainly to align ourselves uh, with what is actually global best practice in terms of the use of the valuation effects uh, of the foreign exchange reserves that the Reserve Bank manages on behalf of the government. Yeah, and you've emphasized, you know, over this past week that this is without compromising buffers to absorb any future exchange rate swings and uh, the solvency of the Saab as well. So where we've had this asset that can be liquidated, DG, why haven't we touched it sooner? And is there a danger of these funds being misappropriated down the line? I mean, how do we reduce the risk of spending it whenever we're in a fix? So part of the challenge was that it was actually not an asset, it was a contingent asset, which actually meant that we couldn't access the asset up until now. And so one of the things we wanted to do is to be able to allow us, as other countries do, to be able, uh, as the government, to access, to access the asset. In fact, had we done this sooner, what would mm -hmm. have happened is that steadily over the years, smaller amounts would have likely flowed to the fiscus as the currency depreciated. But because this reform wasn't done sooner, the buffers accumulated to such a point that um, a large transfer uh, was in fact inevitable once we, did, once we did the reform. In terms of the second part of your question, um, we've put in place um, very clear rules to ensure that um, there can't be any abuse of this going forward. And these uh, rules are formalized in the form of a uh, memorandum of understanding or, or agreement, sorry, between the governor of the Reserve Bank and the Minister of Finance that also govern how the funds may be used, when they can be used, and what the relevant buffers need to be in order to ensure that we, A, don't compromise, 
the solvency of the uh, Reserve Bank, and B, uh, we ensure that we have sufficient buffers available so that we are not vulnerable to any exchange rate swings. Okay, so we've got now 150 billion rand of Jafekra profits being responsibly worked into the fiscal framework. You weighed up, of course, putting that to work on priority spending or debt, and you've opted for the latter. One imagines it's a decision that triggered um, pretty robust debate with broader government, especially in an election year, DG. Well, I think for us, the um, because the um, Jafekra gains, as it were, is a once-off gain, we are getting um, uh, 100 billion in the first year, 25 billion in each of the two outer years, and then um, we don't know whether there'll be future um, uh, gains from Jafekra to be deployed to the fiscal framework. All of this depends on our assessment of the buffers, the solvency of the bank, and so on. So for us to commit, um, as it were, once off gains to permanent spending priorities uh, would not have been very prudent in our view, which is why we took we took the steps that we that we took. Okay, and the step that you have taken now affords South Africa, as you say, 30 billion rand in new savings over three years as a result of reduced borrowing costs, right? How do we lock in the benefits? And bear with me here, DG, because, you know, we're looking at a raised expenditure ceiling as a result of higher public sector wage bill, um, an increase in social spending as well. And yes, both already provisioned for in the framework pre-Jafekra, but neither of which are growth enhancing. So while you've refra refrained from, you know, this wild spending spree, concern is that reducing expenditure and consumptive expenditure at that is proving intractable and that potentially risking the expenditure ceiling being pierced through yeah look there's quite a lot in your question to unpack so let me try to deal to deal with each of them the first is i i think it 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 is probably true in general terms that consumptive expenditure is not growth enhancing but um it is not something that is as uh, cut and dry as it were um, in particular, if you look at the kind of consumption spending that, for example, goes to things like um, education, uh, the salaries of educators, for example, uh, it, it's not clear to me that one can say that that is not growth enhancing because effectively mm -hmm. that is about investing in the human capital um, 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 of a country. However, I think your broader point is correct, which is that for a long time, time we have underinvested in infrastructure we have underinvested in the capital spending required um, to lift the long run growth outcomes of our economy um, in terms of the the other part of your question how do we ensure that we uh, don't compromise the longer run fiscal sustainability what we've tried to do, and in fact, this is the first um, fiscal year, 23-24, that we will be running a primary surplus. That means that our revenue is greater than our non-interest expenditure. And um, we are increasingly turning towards that as a policy to anchor our fiscal framework as opposed to the expenditure ceiling because of the challenges we've had with the expenditure ceiling uh, in the past. So we believe that provided we maintain this fiscal surplus for, for the next few years, um, debt will in fact peak um, at just over 75% of GDP and come down thereafter, and that will allow us to lock in the gains of the fiscal framework that was stabled last week. Yeah. Having said that, DG, I mean, uh, the point that's been raised is the potential for increased government financing uh, requirements from a lower growth scenario, uh, you know, a heightened socioeconomic demand scenario as well does present downside risk. So how much downside risk are you pricing in? Well, the any fiscal framework that we um, put forward is always subjected to various uh, risks. I think there are two or three main risks that we've that we've identified. The one is around the global economy, um, as well as in particular developments in China as our largest trading partner. If they start struggling, then that obviously has direct implications for our growth 
growth prospects and any additional geopolitical tension that might arise will obviously uh, uh, further uh, damage our, our growth prospects. Uh, domestically, I think we are, um, despite the fact that we believe our spending and our growth numbers are quite prudent, um, we are also aware of the fact that many of our state-owned companies are still uh, um, um, uh, struggling. And to the extent that those struggles continue and to the extent that those um, uh, reforms that we've started to implement take time to bear fruit, there may be uh, um, obviously some spending challenges from that point of view. However, that is not part of our baseline. And, and, and I think we've put together something that we believe uh, takes account of all the risks so that yeah. the main spending pressures have been accommodated in the budget. I'll be getting to the SOE stance in just a bit. Before we do, should we be putting legislative rules in place to protect the fiscal framework and manage debt levels? I mean, that was what economist Isaiah Mflango alluded to in one of the post-budget discussions that was had, you know, so that the politics of the day doesn't influence where and how money is spent, even if the finance minister has reiterated that this wasn't an election budget. Yeah, so what we've done as part of this budget is we are initiating a broader conversation around a fiscal anchor. Uh, we've had the expenditure ceiling in the past. Uh, the expenditure ceiling has not worked as well as we would have liked it to work. And so we are putting forward um, some technical work that we have done and initiating, uh, as I said, a, a broader conversation around that. I think whether it's a legislative rule or not will be an outcome of that conversation. Um, the one thing that is clear, however, is that uh, there's very little um, sense in putting out uh, a fiscal rule that has not been subjected to much broader consultation, because a fiscal rule to be effective requires the buy-in of, of, of everyone that is part of part of the process. So after this budget, we'll be engaging in broader consultation in Parliament, with academia, with civil society, around the idea of the rule. And then the outcomes of that will determine the nature of the rule, as well as how it will be implemented. Okay, so let's go back to a question I alluded to earlier, but then I guess diverged from. How does this, you know, short-term sensible move to reduce debt and its associated cost DG get us out of survival mode and where we need to be in the longer term? I mean, are we going to see, are we seeing enough of a change in the composition of spending that puts us on the right track towards um, better growth outcomes? Yes, I think so. Uh, this budget was a very deliberate attempt um, at, doing, at doing a few things. Um, number one, we wanted to ensure that although we are implementing fiscal consolidation, uh, we still preserve as much as possible some of the key uh, capital uh, spending which is why capital actually uh, capital budgets are actually growing in real terms over the medium term. And I think that was a very important uh, objective of ours. In addition to that, we've also realized that a lot of our capital spending that takes place um, is not necessarily driving the right kind of outcomes, which is why we have also announced as part of this budget, a series of broader infrastructure reforms both on the financing side, but also on the delivery and execution side that will help us to get better um, capital spending outcomes, but also allow us to crowd in more capital spending. And obviously the main uh, area amongst this are the reforms that we are making to the uh, public-private partnership framework. Okay, so let's home in and focus on that in particular, because we've beat, uh, you know, been beating this drum uh, for the longest while. Tackle debt get growth going. But three, as you say, be clear about structural reform, where there are real structural constraints impeding progress, even if spend is directed the right way. It's one of the reasons why, at the moment, each rand of government spend is seeing less than one rand's worth of additional national income, right? So cognizant of what you as National Treasury can do, how is funding being used to actually target structural reform and tackle these underlying problems that strangling growth and so revenue? So the, for the most part, um, the benefit of structural reforms is that they don't actually require a lot of new spending. 
Um, structural reforms are mainly about how you change the rules in order to get better outcomes. And in yeah. particular, how do you facilitate greater participation by the private sector in some of the key areas of the economy? So let's start on the infrastructure side. A clearer, more accessible set of rules around PPPs, for example, that allow us to crowd uh, PPPs into spaces of, um, of, the, uh, of, of government spending where they have been absent uh, um, until now. Areas like uh, water, areas like transport. Of course, we do have the example of Sunroll in transport, but transport more broadly, um, as well as human settlements. If you have a clearer set of rules around how the private sector can participate, that actually alleviates pressure on the budget and allows you better spending outcomes because uh, you are bringing a different kind of um, discipline and expertise to government spending. Then, of course, we have the broader reforms that we've been working on over the last few years, in particular in electricity, uh, freight logistics, and other parts of the network industries, because we've as we all know, these are the key sectors that have been um, uh, dampening our growth prospects over the last few years. Yeah, look, there's certainly a recognition of the toughest stance being taken with SOEs for one, right? Um, do you see the conditionality attached, the repercussions you're enforcing, whether it be with ESCOM or Transnet, really affecting a change in the way things are done, a restructuring DG of the organizations for efficiencies that will see financing flow more effectively driving real solutions? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at, so let's take, um, let's take ESCOM, for example. Um, the starting point for us was actually the conversations that we were having in parliament, where parliamentarians were asking us, um, uh, in lieu of all of these um, guarantees that you are issuing to key state-owned entities, what are you doing to ensure that those contingent liabilities don't become realized? Mm -hmm. And can you not do more from a conditionality perspective so that we ensure that taxpayer uh, uh, funds are better, better deployed and better protected? So that's actually where a lot of the conversation started. We then started initially with ESCOM thinking about how do we leverage some of these guarantee conditions and any uh, conditions associated with a bailout to drive structural reform of the entity as well as the sector and to build in the right kind of sticks where there is not performance. And if you look at the ESCOM example, we have reduced the allocation by 4 billion uh, 2 billion this year, 2 billion the next year, due to a failure of uh, on their part to meet a key condition, which is the sale of the ESCOM finance company. And we have instituted interest on the previously interest uh, free loan that we had. And we are taking a very similar approach uh, with the 47 billion Rand guarantee that we've issued with Transnet, driving structural transformation of the entity, but also of the sector more broadly. Yeah, I want to run with the ESCOM example, because yes, you've cut back quite considerably, but hand in hand with that has come this um, 2 billion Rand conditional grant for smart meters, right? So how do you that you aren't pouring money into a leaking bucket here, you know, where we're looking at misallocated and wasteful expenditure once again, and that the resources are directed where they're supposed to be efficiently, or are your hands tied on this one and it being a case of, I guess, only so much you can do? Well, the uh, smart meter allocation is actually very unique in the sense that it's a conditional grant. So it is particularly ring fenced for the role of smart meters in municipalities. Uh, for us, this is a very important initiative because it goes to the heart of some of ESCOM's challenges uh, in, in the fact that they have um, in excess of 50 billion Rand in outstanding debt from municipalities. And so uh, part of the smart meter initiative is about addressing the culture of payment challenges that we have at a local government level that then feeds through into ESCOM's balance sheet and their ability to prioritize um, the spending required. What's also been possible as part of the ESCOM debt relief is that for the first time, ESCOM is able to prioritize multi-year spending. Mm 
because of their financial challenges, they've not been able to do that. They've not been able to commit to maintenance spending at their key power plants over a medium term and cover those costs in advance. And so there are multiple benefits to how we've structured it because of the nature of electricity as a binding uh, constraint on growth. Absolutely. And, you know, this is key, DG, because until we see um, quality of expenditure bang for our buck, you know, pushback will continue around something like NHI. The 1.4 billion rand capital commitment for NHI in this year's budget is indicative of the commitment to get the ball rolling here. Bottom line, is this something we can afford no matter how noble the cause? I think we are taking a very much phased approach uh, to, to NHI. It is clear that um, there is a legislative process um, underway in order for, uh, for us to have some form of national health insurance. Our focus at the moment is on how do we uh, uh, support that uh, from, a, from a fiscal perspective, but use our resources in order to strengthen the overall health system in preparation of whatever health system we may have in the future. So a lot of our focus in our own discussions with the Department of Health, but also from an allocation point of view, has been about what are the health system strengthening initiatives that need to take place at a hospital level and at a system-wide level to ensure that we get better value for our money in a system that we currently have. And then as the system progresses to uh, its future, uh, one can then start thinking about, well, how do we actually afford um, uh, NHI and what are the implications of NHI for the fiscal framework? Being a part of those conversations about how we get to that point before new funds are released, I mean, are you getting a sense that we can, in fact, get a handle on this, DG? Well, I think it requires still quite a bit of technical work between ourselves and the Department of Health, and that work is ongoing. For us, it's about once we have a sense of a very clear uh, legislative future for NHI, it's then about making sure that however it is implemented is done in a manner that does not compromise um, either the budget that was put forward uh, um, uh, last week or the broader fiscal framework. Yeah, I ask you that question because, you know, it's going to need a new form of funding, as you've spoken about, not just NHI, but something like the basic income grant as well. These are costly endeavors. Are we looking at a clear case here of populist politician versus pragmatist at this point playing itself out where, you know, National Treasury has tried numerous times to shut things down, but domestic shocks and that including civil unrest keeps forcing its hand. Well, I think if you look at the, the words that the Minister of Finance used in his budget speech last week, uh, when he spoke, for example, about the Social Relief of Distress Grant, um, the approach that we've taken is that we have made provision, uh, certainly in 24-25 for the Social Relief of Distress Grant, and then a provisional allocation in the two outer years. Why is that allocation provisional? It's provisional because there's still quite a lot of work to be done for us to look into our entire social safety net, the entire social protection system, and see how do we want to reconfigure it in a way that A, addresses our pressing social needs, but B, does not compromise our fiscal framework over the long run. And that's the work that's going to be required uh, between now and the medium-term budget policy statement. It's so interesting, Gigi, because, you know, we're going down this NHI route, for example, on the one hand. On the other, as you spoke about earlier, we're talking about the liberalization of uh, generation space. So shifting towards PPP models on energy, but also road transport logistics. And it seems at odds here. So what kind of conversations should we be having with private sector so that we don't go full circle back to a situation of bailouts crowding out priority spend? Yeah, I think I think that brings us back to the uh, triple P issue, because, mm -hmm. uh, as I've said before, there is no reason for us not to have a greater number of PPPs, for example, in the health sector um, or in how we deliver 
um, human settlement, uh, you know, for example. And part of the reason we have um, put forward the new triple P regulations for public comment last week is precisely because we want to engage the private sector and other role players um, in terms of how do we reconfigure the PPP landscape in order to crowd in much greater levels of private sector investment into the key service delivery areas of government. Yeah, certainly something like an increase in the limit for renewable projects starts getting private sector more involved in energy infrastructure. It breeds life, I guess, into the rhetoric that the state doesn't need to do it all. And it's very interesting because a conversation that I had with Jacob Marocha, who's former ESCOM CEO last year, um, you know, he said state management is different from state ownership. State ownership is put people you trust in those positions and you get out of the way. That's how we salvage things. So you're saying that we are seeing a moving towards that kind of thinking. The, the Minister of Finance always makes the point that we've we've spent uh, 10 years or so trying to fix ESCOM instead of fixing the electricity sector. Mm. And, and if you look at some of the reforms that have taken place over the last while, you just spoke about the amendment of Schedule 2 of the Electricity Regulation Act in order to allow greater levels of private sector investment. And you look at the broader um, changes around how ESCOM is being restructured. Uh, we announced, for example, in the budget as well, um, a pilot that we are working on for uh, this year for private sector investment in the transmission um, in the transmission space and so on. So I do think that there's an acknowledgement that A, um, given the electricity needs that our country has, be the desire of the private sector to support and their ability to do so uh, from a balance sheet perspective, it is it makes a lot of sense for us to collaborate, whether it's in the transmission or the generation space on solving our energy constraint uh, with the help of the private sector. Okay, so we're looking at then a crowding in of private sector investment and, you know, that happening vol voluntarily as opposed to uh, compelling private sector investment into our developmental needs. So I've got to ask you, DG, before I let you go, what's your take on prescribed assets legislation here that compels pension fund managers to invest in, uh, in government stock? Because that is something people are once again just struggling to make any sense of. Yeah, I think if you, from, from our perspective, uh, part of the um, reforms that we are introducing on the infrastructure space is precisely to allow the uh, private sector to invest in infrastructure provision uh, without us having to require any form necessarily of prescription. So, for example, if you start um, delivering the kinds of instruments that we were talking about in the budget last week, yeah. infrastructure bonds or special vehicles through which the private sector can participate in government investment, then you achieve the objective of greater leverage of pension fund and other assets uh, without having to resort to um, having to prescribe it, which is why there was such an emphasis in the budget on these unique infrastructure instruments that we'll be introducing in the coming months. And it's absolutely crucial, right, where there's, you know, there's something like that, a statement that gets made, a possible legislation that's being put forward that, that gets people's backs up against the wall, where there's a limit to how far you can push on tax collection. I know, uh, you know, you haven't adjusted uh, tax brackets for inflation this year, and that sees you garner 16 billion for the fiscus via personal income tax. It's a stealthy, broad-based move, but it does raise the tax burden. And there's a fine line to tread there um, you know, if we refer to the Laffer curve, uh, bottom line is we need growth. And while supporting growth in a fiscally sustainable manner is key, it's certainly not enough to catalyze development on its own. DG, uh, what an interesting conversation we've had with you over the past 30 minutes. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you today. So thanks so much for sharing your time with us. 30 minutes, not nearly enough to get through all the uh, intricacies and the complexities. But, uh, but once again, thank Thank you so much and uh, for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Alicia. Much appreciated.
And for those of you who've tuned in, thank you for watching as well. You can keep the conversation going on various me uh, social media platforms using the hashtag ThinkBigPSG. Uh, and until next time, it's goodbye from me, Alicia.